What's happening, family? It is your man, CRB Jr. here at Motown Mafia Podcast. Of course, a Big Boss Filmworks production. Hope all is well out there in the world. I am here, as always, with my partner in crime, my mellow man, what they call one of those the day one the other half of Big Boss Filmworks. Big Lou, how you feeling, baby? Man, life is good, man. Back to burn. We got some new stuff coming up. We got, uh, oh, before I really get started, Okay. I just had an interaction. Brother, forgive me for getting your name. I was up at a restaurant and he recognized the t-shirt. And he said, where can I get that t-shirt at? And I had a Motown Mafia podcast t-shirt and he, and he was obviously a fan. So I said, check right there under us in the, in the box right below. You can pick up any of the t-shirts and I'll be putting new designs up. ASAP. That's awesome. That is awesome. We should do that. By the time we do our next podcast, we're going to have a nice little promotion because um, we should do something for the people here. Got to. We should do something for the people here. Let everybody get a little get a little Big Boss, Motown Mafia swag. Um, yeah. It's all good because we got a whole online store for the apparel arm um, of our situation. Um, you've designed a few t-shirts in your day, have you not, Mr. Stevens? That's how we met. That is how That's we met. That's the day we met. You looked at the catalog of T-shirts that I that, that I put together, and you was like, "Oh, these are pretty clever." <laughs> <laughs> and from there, that's that's where this whole thing started. Was was merch? Was merch? That's right. That's right. We'll have to tell the whole story again every time I think about Eddie Folks and that techno festival <laughs> and uh, the six hundred shirts you got done for us. <laughs> oh yeah. Do we? Um, do we have a technical? No, no not it's, it's technical. all good there. Yeah, it's everything's there. cool. So again, family, hope everybody's good out here. We're good here at Big Boss Filmworks. Um, got a chance to see um, some of the stuff we put up last week um, concerning a tribute to um, a dear friend of both of ours, uh, my brother from another brother, mother, uh, Craig Joseph Johnson, a.k.a. 250, and uh, Lou's grandma, Annie Stevens. So we are back to work, um, including both of those great people home um their home going and um we 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 excited to be back we got a lot of stuff coming up your way we got making another mafia making, right lou making another mafia i'll be dropping some clips soon yeah yeah new trailer new trailer all of that before the holidays before the holidays we're, we're, we're looking to get that out and Absolutely. get company wet with all of that um so kind of get into i guess what we'll start off the conversation with today um which is gonna do a little throwback um freddie freddie myers new york freddie i don't know how many of you guys have or have not heard of him but we're gonna unpack a little bit of his story and hopefully you guys are interested you can go check him out as we attempt to um give the roses even though it may be late for some of these street legends again as um mm -hmm. as the world of hip-hop and of urban culture becomes so mainstream you know, I think we've we've been consistent with our thought that the people who really made this culture mm -hmm. and, and, and were the, the pioneers of this hustle game street culture, that people recognize that and that they don't get all lost um, because these guys did their thing before Facebook. They did their thing before Instagram. Yeah. Um, they did their thing before TikTok, before YouTube. But it was their actions that set the whole culture that led to this multi-billion dollar thing that's all going on yeah. you know all around us so um yeah, as you recall and, and as we documented making the mafia when we started this thing um we obviously consumed all kind of content of pretty much you know obviously you looked at the mr untouchable by uh, dane dash the nikki bond story yeah um the felix mitchell story yeah um, everybody we we went and we you know we were going to go down go down this road of getting the eddie jackson and courtney brown story out there and one of the more interesting characters when i was doing that that had escaped me and you gotta know with having visited the old man for over a decade on and off in federal penitentiary and, and eddie's old man and the fed joining all the other family and friends pretty much all the names of all the players we'd either heard of i mean between eddie and pops um and the rest of the crew dog i mean half of them they had interacted right with, i was gonna say they ran into a lot or of them, ran into them but business. um one of the guys that had escaped 
our uh, conversation or access to was a guy by the name of Freddie Myers. Again, New York Freddie Myers. He was chronicled mm -hmm. on uh, in Feds Magazine back in the day. And shout out again to the people at Feds Magazine. Mm -hmm. um, it was Feds that ran the first cover story on the Eddie Jackson organization. Mm -hmm. uh, right after we did that ad in Don Diva, uh, the Feds cover story, which has launched it. So, you know, shout out to those guys too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, this guy Freddie Myers was a big deal in Harlem. Um, and there was, of course, so many correlations. Obviously, a lot of Freddie's run happened during the same era. During the same with your, with your dad's and Eddie's era. Ex exactly. And um, what really stuck out to me, though, was that Freddie's run really went, I mean, you know, most, all respect to all the hustlers out there, but, you know, most of, most of the hustle stories are flash in the pans. You know, it's a six-month run here, a yeah. year run here. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, that big flash of right. glory or whatnot. Um, that's the thing that made the Eddie Jackson organization so very unique. Well, two other things. The, that during the Grand Hustle, the Golden Run, from 69 to 77, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's eight years of street dominance in the city in Detroit when Detroit was one of the major cities in the country at the time. I mean, so to stay at the top of the food chain for eight years in Detroit, that was, that's, that, that doesn't get done anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and won't. And then, of course, the whole legacy that would would follow the the fruit from the Eddie Jackson tree. Demetrius in the '80s. Demetrius in the '90s. You know, my father in the '80s. My father in the '90s. Mm -hmm. uh, Butch in the '80s. Butch in the '90s. Uh, to Otis. To um, all the other people who mm -hmm. came along the way that came off of the uh, Eddie Jackson tree. You know, four generations, 40 years worth of, um, of street legend right. continued to roll. But yeah, this guy, New York, Freddie Myers, he started doing his thing in the late 60s. Um, and he was indicted, or the feds came and got him on March the 6th, 1983. So if you go from 69, 69 to 80 is 11 years, plus so 2, mm -hmm. 13 years. That's a run. That's a run. That's a run, yeah. The name of the Freddie Jack, I'm um, sorry, not Freddie, <laughs> he was far from a Freddie Jackson. Right, he wasn't a Freddie, Freddie Jackson. Freddie Myers should never be confused with Freddie Jackson. <laughs> um, New York Freddie's uh, crew's name was Good and Plenty. Okay. Is what the streets called them, right? Um, because they had good product and they gave out plenty of plenty it. Plenty of it. Yeah, yeah, it was called Good and Plenty. Um, and you know, I, there's a there's a documentary that's called the um, Freddie yeah, Myers story. Yeah. So yeah. again, um, if you guys you can check it out on YouTube. I, I suggest if you're into this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. um, you check out the Freddie Myers documentary. Uh, it's amazing a guy who, who really had the runny head and the level head, but kind of like Pops and later, they were a lower, <laughs> as low profile as a hustler can be when you're doing. Eight million dollars, ten million dollars yeah. a month. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you can't, you can't. But uh, be too um, low key. I think being they were in New York, mm -hmm. and I guess during the early parts of his run, you had Frank Matthews and Nicky Bonds, and then later Guy Fisher. Mm -hmm. I just think there were so. I mean, he was a whale, but there were just so many super whales in mm -hmm. New York, mm -hmm. and New York just being New York and just a much easier town to blend in, right. having a ton of money. Mm -hmm. um, he was able to, he, his name didn't overring. Right. But um, he was definitely right there with all the other big guys in New York. Um, Nicky Barnes and Guy Fisher and um, Frank Matthews. And maybe not, nobody probably is on the level of Frank Matthews. Right. right but he right. had an interesting story, again, very similar to my father and Eddie with and Butch. Frank. Las Vegas, right? Oh, so, um, yeah. you know, again, you can see this stuff in real detail if you look at the Freddie Myers uh, documentary. Mm -hmm. But just like um, Eddie and Pops ran into Frank Matthews at the crab table, right? right? Mm -hmm. And and got to talking shit, gambling with each other, and and and, and formed a relationship. Freddie Myers tells the same kind of thing that he's actually on a plane going to New York. Okay. Fate would have it; he's literally sitting next to. The big fella. The big fella himself, the, the, the Don Dada's Don Dada, the hustler, the <laughs> boss's boss, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right? He's sitting next to Frank Matthews, Frank Peeps' watch, and they engage in conversation, and um, 
and you know they they formed a relationship and he talks about later that um after they got back to new york they uh, you know he rode uh frank had of course a limousine wait for him as soon as they landed in vegas he yeah, tells freddie myers you can ride with me they you know and i guess i mean again just big fall really big fella stuff you guys would like to hear real big fella stuff because these guys again um and i don't want to sound old <laughs> even though i am old now um but just Again, they didn't have Instagram and YouTube to chronicle, or, or and TikTok and Facebook to chronicle the lavish lifestyle. So now, and and what I think I want the younger audience to understand, I was older cats my age will will get the lifestyle that you see today's hip hop artists living mm -hmm. is the lifestyle that they saw and heard about from guys like from this. Guy, right. And I say that with all respect, and I'm I am so happy th about this hip-hop thing and the fact that these young black men are making serious money serious. and getting to a real bad mm -hmm. um i just pray and hope that we get some financial literacy because it was the lack of financial literacy of the freddie myers the eddie jacksons yeah um not that they were stupid they all bought real estate and had legitimate businesses but really being a little more savvy and understanding yeah, when you're handling to transfer that to wealth. transfer that money and make sure the generational wealth mm -hmm. you know yeah. um you know really occurred you know in our case mom made some incredibly strategic decisions mm -hmm. which has allowed and served the family well you know over the last 50 years but Absolutely. Um, a shout out to mom um and out miss brown you know if every if every family that had hit the the big times and the hustles that had a woman like mom yeah oh. <laughs> I, I i don't know if many of these uh publications happen i mean no or maybe these public oh, go ahead unpack that for me well i'm saying just like uh you know like the bernstein family well you know yeah you did you do have the purple gang the Purple Gang comes and, and, and they have their run mm -hmm. during their time, but the wealth gets transferred and most of those kids are what now? Journalists. Shout out Scott Bernstein. Scott out uh, Scotty. Uh, yeah. Lawyers. Doctors. Well, what's the, it's an old adage I had heard that the difference between Jewish gangsters and Italian gangsters is J Italian gangsters kids grow up to be gangsters. Jewish gangsters kids grow up to be doctors and lawyers. There you go. Yeah. And again, that's a financial literacy thing. And mm -hmm. even though Lord knows the mob ended up transferring a lot of that money and cleaning it up. Yeah, into legitimate into businesses. Into legitimate businesses. And so that's what I was thinking. I'm, I, I'm so, because uh, my mentor always said, you know, uh, Courtney Jr., dwell in possibilities. So, well, you know, you when know. you do, like, uh, they do some time what they call revisionist history in fiction. Mm -hmm. What if this, what if the South had won the Civil War? Right. You know, what if America had lost World War II? What would the world be like? Right. You got, um, so that was in 69, I believe, when 69 or 70, when Freddie Myers runs into Frank Matthews. Um, Pop and Eddie would run into Frank Matthews in 72. Okay. So you've got these, all these whales of black hustlers coming and going in Vegas. Right on. That if they would have ever gotten in the same room, well, they did all get in the same room, but really pulled their resources and pulled their networks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, like, they made hundreds of millions back that translated in today's money is billions then without working together or not working together directly. But what, what would those organizations and hustles look like if they would have been coordinating their efforts, coordinating their resources? They buy cities. They would have bought cities. It'd be it, like... It would have changed, literally right. changed the landscape of America. It would have. Because on some lower levels, it did transform Harlem. The hustle money transformed Harlem. Hustle money transformed Detroit. Detroit. But on very small scales. Right. As in, because... Um, you put that money together, that happens like how cocaine changed uh, Miami. Miami. Exactly. Exactly. Or, or what Prohibition did with the Italians once Lucky Luciano organized them under the commission and broke up the families and broke them in the families with, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and then they were able to take all that liquor, that illegal liquor money and do shit like that.
1973. The Detroit Free Press's front page proclaims, Dope Kingpins Get Away With It. They had names like Jesse James, Pretty Ricky, The Black Greek, and Mr. Clean. Two of the 12 men listed as Detroit's biggest heroin dealers were next door neighbors. And in reality, they were the two largest heroin dealers in Detroit, dwarfing the other men on the list. Eddie the Fat Man Jackson, charismatic son of a pool hall owner and his chief lieutenant, Courtney the Field Marshal Brown, a former city bus driver, had built an empire on a par with men like Nicky Barnes and Frank Lucas of New York. But theirs was a very different and in many ways more sophisticated operation than Barnes and Lucas's, based on family ties and finesse more than murder and mayhem. They truly were the Motown Mafia and the saga of Eddie Jackson, Courtney Brown, and their families stretched from the 1960s and into the present day.